So it is now my great pleasure to introduce um, my good friend and Peace Camp buddy, uh, Roberta Meek. Roberta was born into an activist family in Philadelphia. She grew up knowing that freedom is not free and justice is not a guarantee. As a young girl, she had the unusual opportunity to meet Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because her father, Bill Meek Sr., was one of the key organizers of King's visits to the city. So it is not surprising that Roberta's career path weaved its way through the labor, civil rights, and social justice battles in her adopted community of Allentown. Her work has ranged from serving as a chief steward and later executive president of CWA Local 13500 to independent consulting work facilitating a myriad of programs that address racial justice, cultural pluralism, and nonviolent problem solving. Most recently, Roberta has taught and served as the director of Africana Studies program at Muhlenberg College. All of her work has been shaped by the lessons taught by Dr. King, lessons her family embraced and instilled in all their children. And we're very pleased that members of Roberta's family are in our audience tonight, and also that Roberta shared with us a bio written by one of her sisters uh, who may recognize these words, some of these words that I'm reading to you. As a historian specializing in African American history, Roberta collaborated with Touchstone Theater to produce and present Another River Flows, the African American experience in the Lehigh Valley. This project allowed her to blend her three passions, history, community building, and music. She also played Abuela Claudia in the Lin-Manuel Miranda musical in the Heights at Muhlenberg College in 2016. Roberta has sung with local choruses and at community events. She has frequently been the music leader at Peace Camp and her singing is beloved by campers and volunteers alike. In addition to singing, she puts the songs in context, teaching about civil rights and activism. Roberta's two children and two oldest grandchildren have attended and helped at Peace Camp, and we're looking forward to welcoming her two youngest grandchildren as campers in the future. If you would like to hear more about Roberta and in her own words, you may listen to a re the recent interview she did on WDIY, and you can find that by going to WDIY.org and doing a search for Roberta Meek. And now I will hand the microphone over to you, Roberta. Well, thank you, Margot, for that wonderful introduction. I'm not sure I recognize who you're talking about, but um, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak with you all tonight. Lapoco is an organization I have supported in one form or another for nearly 25 years. And I'm thrilled that you would trust me with your annual fundraiser and for giving me free reign on what to talk about. And in terms of making that decision, after the 2020 election cycle, which is one for the books, um, it seems apropos to take on the subject of voting and voting rights. And as this is Women's History Month and just a couple weeks out from Black History Month, I'll share with you some history, some stories, and some song or song fragments um, that provide some context for where we are with this subject today in the United States. My telling of this history will focus largely on Black women who have resisted, protested, and organized to ensure the right to vote for all Americans, but particularly Black Americans. And before I begin, um, I want to make sure that you know that I did not coin the term song talk. I'm not sure if she is the first or only. Uh, the person who I was the fabulous, brilliant, and uber talented activist scholar Bernice Johnson Reagan. And I'll be um, talking about her a little later for those unfamiliar with who she is. Um, she did um, 
if you're familiar at all with Sweet Honey in the Rock, she is the founding mother of that. Um, I saw her about 10 or 12 years ago, and her song talk, as she called it, was revelatory for me. She seamlessly wove freedom songs, hymns, spirituals throughout her talk about the movement and her experiences in it. And I honor her tonight with my humble attempt to mimic that mastery. So um, I don't know how many of you can pinpoint the earliest memory of the importance of electoral politics and the right to vote, but I wanna share a story of my first concrete memory of both. Growing up in a very political household that taught me from toddlerhood that standing up for one's rights and the rights of others is as important as breathing. I had already had years of experience participating in pickets. Uh, for example, those that were in support of the sit-in movement in the South. Um, but in 1964, when I was seven going on eight, is the moment that is seared in my memory of understanding that being eligible to vote does not mean you have the ability to vote. Um, in August of 1964, my family traveled to Atlantic City. Staying in a hotel was an exciting and unusual luxury for us, and we played and swam at the beach. I specifically remember that we were going to Atlantic City because with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, uh, just about a month before that in 1964, we were no longer restricted to visiting what was known as Chicken Bone Beach. As an aside, Chicken Bone Beach was the only part of the beach that Black people were permitted to uh, visit between the years of 1900 and until after the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, when the law opened up the beaches to everybody. And it's important to note that before 1900, the beaches were not segregated in Atlantic City. But the devastating Supreme Court decision, Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, meant that it was not just the South that ended up um, having significantly greater restrictions on the movement and the abilities of Black people to live as full human beings. It affected the North and the West as well with de facto segregation, meaning in practice, as opposed to de jour, which was in law as it was in the South. So anyway, back to my story of politics and voting. What I didn't recall until I became a historian and put some pieces of the puzzle together in my mind is that because the Democratic National Convention was held in Atlantic City in, 1960, in August of 1964, um, we were there also in retrospect, I'm sure, because my father wanted to be there in the fray, up close and personal. And that's the first time I remember us as a family watching the National Democratic National Convention, which we did throughout my childhood. And being in Atlantic City afforded us the chance to watch since we didn't always have a TV or at least not a working TV. And for those who were black in the audience, maybe some of you white people, I don't know, but we often had a TV on top of a TV with some antennas and foil and I don't think we had any in 1964. So we had the ability to watch because we were in the hotel. And my dad rolled the TV in front of us as we gathered in one of the two hotel rooms that we were staying. And I remember being riveted as Fannie Lou Hamer delivered her impassioned speech, later known as the Is This America speech, to the Credentials Committee at the convention. President Lyndon Johnson was not particularly happy with this as he thought he was gonna have an easy breezy time getting to nomination and was not happy about the distraction. So he called a press conference as she was speaking, but the news reporters had a different idea, the networks that were um, showing the convention and they ran the full speech and all of the protest, et cetera, that was associated with it later in the day. And um, Hamer's speech was an attempt to convince the convention to seat delegates 
of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. The MFDP, as it was often called and is today in history books, was established in the spring, I think it might have been April of 1964, to challenge the all-white Mississippi delegation to the convention. And they had come to Atlantic City with 64 black and four white delegates. Um, along with many others, including my family, who were apparently there in support. So you had folks like Victoria Gray Adams and Aaron Henry, who were also involved with MFDP, Ella Baker, MLK. You had a cadre of um, organizers, activists, advocates who were there in support. And Hamer's testimony before the Credentials Committee lasted for about actually more than eight minutes, as she recounted stories of her own experience as a sharecropper, attempting to register herself and to help register others in Mississippi. She explained how, on the way back from a particular voter registration workshop in 1963, she was arrested and beaten. Hamer provided explicit details, including that she was carried out of her cell into another cell, these are her words, where they had two Negro prisoners. The first Negro prisoner ordered me by orders from the state highway patrolman for me to lay down on a bunk bed on my face. And I laid on my face. The first Negro began to beat me. After the first Negro had beat until he was exhausted, the state highway patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack. The second Negro began to beat and I began to work my feet. And the state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro who had beat me to sit on my feet, to keep me from working my feet. I began to scream and one white man got up and began to beat me in the head and tell me to hush. One white man, my dress had worked up high, he walked over and pulled my dress. I pulled my dress down and he pulled my dress back up. I was in jail when Medgar Evers was murdered. All of this is on account of we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the MFDP, or I think she referred to it as the Freedom Democratic Party, is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives are threatened daily, because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Thank you. As she pondered whether to accept a compromise offer to seat two MFDP delegates at large, meaning that they wouldn't represent Mississippi, their home state, Hamer, Bernice Johnson Reagan, who I mentioned earlier, the Freedom Singers, MFDP delegates, Ella Baker, and supporters gathered outside in front of the images of the three SNCC volunteers who had been murdered at the beginning of the summer. The car, which had been purchased by playwright Lorraine Hansberry, that the three young men, Goodman, Scher Schwerner, and Cheney, had been driving that fateful night outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi, and which had been dug up from the water when the bodies were discovered, was on display in Atlantic City as well. And with Hamer leading in true congregational sing, uh, sing tradition, the group broke into, go telling on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain, to let my people go who's that yonder dressed in red let my people go it must be the children by moses led let my people go go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain to let my people go. And while leaders such as MLK and others tried to persuade the MFDP to accept the offer, they unanimously voted to refuse it. Hamer argued, quote, we didn't come all this way for no two seats when all of us is tired, unquote. 
So as historian Keisha Blaine points out, Hamer's televised speech delivered before millions addressed two central issues that remain relevant in contemporary Black political discourse, voter suppression and state-sanctioned violence. I tell you this story to begin a historical journey to figure out how we got to that particular dramatic moment in my childhood and to help explain how we continue to see efforts to disenfranchise folks today. So voting rights in the U.S. have a long history of exclusion, not just for Black Americans. You're talking about Native Americans, Chinese Americans. Many folks have been um, the right has been withheld. I'm going to focus on the African-American story for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So as of the founding of the nation, voting was the purview of white men who owned property and was only expanded with any real impact on elections when some, not all, states began to allow universal white male suffrage, regardless of property ownership in the election of 1828, you know, the one with Andrew Jackson, the common man one, who then took all the common men who were Native American and marched them out on a trail of tears. Anyway, that's an aside. Interestingly, some states in the years of the early republic, so the late 18th century and early um, 19th century, um, allowed even universal suffrage, regardless of color or gender or uh, property ownership, but that quickly disappeared. Um, so that meant that some women, some black women, some black men, some unpropertied white men actually had the vote taken from them in those early years. Um, so prior to the Civil War, the majority of people of African descent in the U.S. were enslaved. Um, they weren't considered citizens or even considered fully human. African Americans were deemed, as we have all been taught, three-fifths of a person, which was spelled out in our founding documents as a compromise and a way to boost the amount of representation slaveholding states had in Congress. The Dred Scott decision of 1850 and further confirmed that citizenship and personhood were denied African Americans, so voting was certainly not a right. The decision stated, quote, the words people of the United States and citizens are synonymous terms and mean the same thing. They both describe the political body who form the sovereignty and who hold the power and conduct of the government through their representatives. The question before us, whether the class of persons described in the plea in abatement, meaning people of African descent, compose a portion of this people and are constituent members of this sovereignty. We think they are not, and that they are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution, and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. An absolutely horrific ruling. So going into the Civil War, which erupts in 1861, Black people remained, as codified by the highest court in the land, less than full human beings. And after the cataclysmic Civil War, the Reconstruction Era represented this wonderful moment of great promise, but ultimately white supremacy prevailed. The three construction, Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, in theory, overturned the peculiar institution of slavery and granted African Americans rights as citizens. But let's take a look at those three amendments. The 13th, which theoretically abolishes slavery and indentured servitude. The 14th, granted birthright citizenship, which by the way, becomes a battle for the years after that as mass immigration starts to happen and is under battle today, under siege today. Um, so it gave them birthright citizenship as well as civil and legal rights. And the 15th granted black male suffrage. But it isn't that simple. 
unfortunately. The 13th Amendment, many of you may know from Ava DuVernay's uh, wonderful documentary. As a historian, I have a few nitpicky things. But anyway, 13th demonstrated that the 13th Amendment included an exception that those who were convicted of a crime were not included in the protections of the amendment. Um, as historian and my personal advisor in grad school, Heather Ann Thompson notes, section two of the 14th Amendment penalized those who denied the vote to men of each state, but at the same time permitted disenfranchisement of eligible men without affecting representation if those citizens had participated in rebellion or a crime. So as you can tell from those words, it's intended to uh, target former Confederates. But while in theory it's meant for that, this provision actually caused incredible harm to African Americans, where white Southerners policed Black folks and charged many with crimes that had, were newly created, had never existed on the books. So coupled with the 13th Amendment's caveat of um, anyone convicted of a crime not being exempt from you know, the ability to enslave or indenture, um, meant that many, many Black people were imprisoned, disenfranchised, and forced to do, to do um, unpaid labor. And that exists today. So for example, the former Graterford prison here in Pennsylvania is where Victoria's Secret bras were made. I'm not sure if since they have moved to a newer facility across the way, whether or not that's still the case. But this is just one example of the many, many products that you consume on a daily basis that have been um, made by prison labor. And so why is this so important, you ask? Because the US, and we're going to flash forward now for a moment, post-1970, when Angela Davis said that she considered it mass incarceration when there were 200,000 people in prison, when we flash forward from 1970 to today, mass incarceration has escalated to the point where we are the, the nation that uh, imprisons the most. We are responsible for 25% of the world's prison population. Many of those folks are in there are disproportionately disadvantaged and they are black and brown people as well as people who are impoverished. And what's important when we're talking about Black women is that the, there is a rapidly increasing Black female prisoner population that has emerged, uh, particularly post-2010. So we haven't really escaped slavery, indentured servitude, or the threat of voting rights being taken from us. Another example that's more recent, again, thinking about these linkages back to this post-Civil War Reconstruction era is the Richardson v. Ramirez decision in 1974, which declared that the 14th Amendment permitted the disenfranchisement of those convicted of crimes. So while laws in some states have begun to ease these harsh rules, many remain committed to denying prisoners the right to vote, both while they are serving their terms and some states continue to deny prisoners the right to vote for life. They are disenfranchised for life. Those are usually for felony convictions. Um, and again, the states are diminishing how many of them are actually enforcing those rules, but there are still far too many that are doing that. So you're talking about uh, the sentencing project, I believe has the numbers at over 5 million people disproportionately black and brown, at least half of that, so two plus million, who are disenfranchised as a result of these law laws today. So we're talking a devastating impact. The 15th Amendment provides this wonderful glimpse and horrifying glimpse into the kinds of barriers to voting that black people have faced for generations. African-American activists like Sojourner Truth, and Frances Ellen um, Watkins Harper, 
had worked side by side with folks like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, or Susan B. Anthony, you know, our famous and revered white suffragists. And they had worked side by side with them, um, particularly in, during the abolition uh, era, you know, abolitionism. And we find though, post-Civil War, when the 15th Amendment is being debated as to what it will actually grant, who it will grant the vote to, um, we see a real schism begin to happen. So by 1866 and beyond, um, as another of my mentors, Betty Collier Thomas notes, the argument in favor of limiting suffrage to black men and anger and bitterness white suffrage leaders who felt that if, if the choice had to be made, educated white females were more deserving so deserving of the vote than illiterate black males. And therefore the old abolitionist coalition, which included a racial and gender mix of key reform leaders began to collapse. As an example of the kinds of language used by some of these most famous uh, feminists, Stanton in 1867 at a conference is quoted as stating, quote, the time for doing justice to the Negro is past, unquote. Now, Truth and Harper woke up that morning with their eyes, stayed on freedom. Yes, they woke up that morning with their eyes, stayed on freedom. Woke up that morning with their eyes, stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And while they both supported the idea of universal suffrage, as black women shackled on both sides by race and gender, they saw black male suffrage as a major victory for the race and recognized that universal suffrage sadly would have to wait. But that schism we see repeated during second wave feminism, et cetera, where you're, you're finding that the goals of black and white women are not always the same. So when we talk about the women's movement, one of the things that I often tell my students is, which movement do you mean? If you mean the white women's movement, you need to say that because they were not all one. That did not mean that there were not some black people involved in the first movement, in second wave feminism, but for the most part, those movements were segregated. Um, what happens next, remains an explanation of why voting rights became a carefully and violently guarded privilege of white folks. The 14th and 15th Amendments opened the floodgates of black male participation in electoral politics, and scores of men won seats at the local, state, and national tables, including a um, U.S. Senator. And once that disappears, we don't see another senator until the 1960s who was black. And we have a handful basically in total. So what you had with black political participation is the emergence of the KKK, which emerges almost immediately after the Civil War. And they waged their own war on black people churches, schools, and the Union League, which were uh, re radical Republicans, um, spaces where a lot of teaching would go on in all of these spaces, and the politicizing of African Americans newly freed from slavery. Um, these spaces were frequent targets of mob violence. Many were burned to the ground with and without people inside at the time of the attack. Some laws, like the Black Codes and practices meant to contain Black people, began again almost immediately after the war. Like in Mississippi, Black Codes were passed in 19, 1865. The war had just ended in April of that year. But those laws meant to contain Black people were happening across the South. But after 
the end of Reconstruction, which followed the compromise of 1876 over the presidential election and the withdrawal of troops from the South, Black franchisement and office holding came to almost a complete end. I think the last um, office holder who had been elected in the South, a uh, Black man, maybe 1900 was the, the end of that completely but he was pretty much a solo, a solo act. And again, that devastating Plessy decision in 1896 proved the death knell of progress. And the period that followed, um, which you had an influx of mass Im immigration from um, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe. So this is where many of you, if you're Jewish, Italian, um, Polish, et cetera, if you're any of these that were not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were coming in between right after the war, like 1880 or so to 1920s until 1924 when they cut off immigration, basically, because they were looking like they do today for a nativist white Anglo-Saxon Protestant um, nation. And so this era known as the progressive era was actually a regressive era for African Americans. And um, Rayford Logan, a, a scholar and historian, a black historian and scholar in 1940 or so, coined the term for that period as the nadir or the lowest point for African Americans in the country. I would argue that there have been far too many of those nadir, so I'm not sure if I could specifically point to that one, sadly. Um, so, while black men living in some states, in some areas in the northern or western areas, were able to exercise the right to vote, their numbers were so small that they did not sway elections and were not a political force. It was really the great migration between 1900 and 1930, and then again in the lead up to and immediately following World War II, that saw elections hinge on black support as black people moved to uh, the urban North and West. And historian Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham notes that, quote, for Black Southern migrants, the ballot box no less than heightened employment opportunity and the greater social mobility served as a badge of freedom from the Jim Crow world they fled, unquote. And one of my favorite examples of this emerging political clout is that of Ida B. Wells Barnett, who I affectionately call Ida B. She's a perfect example of how women are made invisible in historical retelling, or if they are visible, it is because some historian, likely a woman, has resurrected them. Ida B. Um, was run out of her home and business in Memphis on the threat of death because of her harsh critique and writings on what she deemed Southern horrors, meaning lynching. After several years of travel and temporary stay, she settled in Chicago, Illinois. She is best known for her anti-lynching work, which by the way, precedes even the founding of the NAACP by 17 years. So if anyone tries to you know, give total credit to the anti-lynching movement to the NAACP, they have, they have me to contend with, like that really matters. But anyway, um, so it's important to understand Ida B. in conversation with Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. She, by the end of the um, 19th century and into the very early part of the 20th century, she was the most radical of those three. You often see, again, in historical retelling, Du Bois and Washington as polar opposites with Du Bois being the radical and um, Washington being the more conservative. But the bottom line is that neither of them could be deemed radical at that moment. Indeed, W.E.B. Du Bois, who lives for so many years, he morphs over time and becomes more and more radical, but he doesn't match Ida B.'s radical nature um, until at least a decade or two after she is really, um, she's really out there, um, and wonderfully so. And so what you have then is she became a political force in Chicago. 
She was a champion of women's suffrage, but was unapologetically a race woman. And to the chagrin of many white suffragists, who by the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as we have already discussed, were focused on expediency rather than justice for all, Ida B. marched in the 1913 Women's March in Washington, but with a clear-eyed focus on universal suffrage as a means to empower Black people and Black women in particular. And, you know, in many ways, Ida B. is the embodiment of them that's got shall get them that's not shall lose so the bible says and it still is news mama may have and papa may have but god bless the child that's got his own that's got his own Yes, the strong gets more while the weak ones fade. Empty pockets don't ever make, they do not make the grade. Mama may have, and your papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Money, you got lots of friends, and they're crowding round that door. But when you're gone and spending ends, haven't sung in a while, they don't come around no more. Rich relations give, they give a crust of bread and such. But you can help yourself, but please do not take too much. But Ida B said, I'm going to take as much as I need because mama may have and papa may have, but God bless me, the child that's got her own. She was deeply involved in Alpha Suffrage Club for Black Women after Illinois adopted suffrage for women in 1913. And the club was in large part responsible for the large black turnout that elected the mayor that year, but importantly elected Oscar de Priest in 1915 as the first black alderman. So in 1919, when women were finally granted the vote, the vote in the 20th Amendment, um, as Rosalind Turberg Penn, who was a historian, argues, quote, Often behind the scenes or ignored in the history of the women's suffrage movement and black suffrage movement, the African-American female was significant in both. And in addition, the struggle to maintain the ballot continued for more than a generation after the passage, meaning of the 20th Amendment. And as the majority of enfranchised black women were robbed of their hard-won ballots by the success of white political supremacy in the South. So it's important to note that from, I'm sorry, 1865 until the presidential election of 1936, the majority of Black voters registered Republican. It was the radical Republicans who put radical reconstruction in place after a period of anemic presidential reconstruction. And the way the two parties were, were and currently are viewed flipped at that point in history with Democrats, with the very important exception of the Dixiecrats or Southern Democrats, Southern white Democrats, being the more liberal party and Republicans being the conservative party. Neither party served, and I would argue in many regards, often does not serve currently the needs of Black people. But at the time that this flips in 1936, it's um, Black people in Southern states, because of things that the Dix Dixiecrats put into place, such as grandfather clauses, poll taxes, literacy tests, and sheer violent intimidation, kept Black Southerners, for the most part, from registering to vote let alone actually voting. 
and at least a decade before most history books mark the beginning of what we call the modern civil rights movement, um, which is during and after World War II, black activists in the South began voter registration campaigns, albeit much smaller than those that happened in the 1960s. Rosa Parks, who was mythologized and taught from preschool on up as a meek and mild seamstress, who was just too tired that day to move on the on the bus in Montgomery was actually a very long-standing activist. She was indeed a quiet woman, but she was anything but meek and mild. She was raised in a home with grandparents who were Garveyites. Just as if you read about Malcolm X, he was also raised in a family that were Garveyites. And this is very key to understanding the radical nature of some of our activist thinking. And so they were Garveyites, Garveyites, and her grandfather used to sit on the front porch with his rifle by his side, and she would often, at the age of 10 and under, sit out with him at night waiting for the KKK. She said he would have loved to have blown somebody away. So again, not that I'm encouraging that, but it's interesting to also note that in the South, owning guns, having guns in the house was a matter of self-protection. Um, and so what we see with Rosa Parks is that she got involved with the NAACP, the local chapter in Montgomery, under le the leadership of E.D. Nixon. And that was a moment in history when there were not many members when Nixon took over that chapter because it was considered dangerous and a serious risk to even be seen as supporting the organization. And she was one of only few, a few women involved in uh, the local chapter. But importantly, by the 1940s, an aspect of Rosa Parks that we especially children do not learn about is that she was working with the Women's Political Council along with folks like Joanne Robinson, who the Women's Political Council and those two players play a key role when we get to the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, they were the backbone of that, not the actual black male preachers, even if, although they took the figurehead role. Um, but importantly, she was also involved in protecting, working to protect black women and girls from sexual violence perpetrated by white men. And they saw voting as connected to the ability to provide that protection for black women. And she was involved in voter registration campaigns with Nixon um, in the 40s. And by 1951, just to give you an example, Montgomery was 37% black, but only 3.7% of black eligible voters were actually registered. Also, to give you an idea of breaking that myth, she was trained at the radical space called the Highlander Folk School, and she was also a mentee of one of my sheroes, Ella Baker. And she and others weren't going to let nobody turn them around, turn them around, turn them around, weren't going to let nobody turn them around, they were going to keep on a walking keep on a talking marching up to freedom land and speaking of ella baker she was a force to be reckoned with she played significant roles in all of the major civil rights organizations of the era from the naacp to sclc to core and in 1957 after the bus boycott when sclc was founded and became what is known as MLK's organization, she was um, involved and hired there. And she believed strongly in what we call participatory democracy. She called it kind of group-centered leadership rather than a hierarchical structure, top-down leadership. And she often challenged MLK and the other Black male um, ministers in SCLC on their style, which she deemed to be autocratic. And after the sit-in movement began in February of 1960, it was Ella Baker who um, called 
these young leaders, uh, mostly black, who were attending black historic, what we now call historically black colleges and universities, which at the time were essentially the only places that black folks could go for higher ed. Um, but as it quickly moved across the South by April of 1960, she called everyone to, together in, at Shaw University in um, Raleigh, North Carolina. And while a mentor, confidant, advisor of these young leaders, she was not the titular head. She did not tell them what to do. Um, she helped them though to craft the founding documents and platform for the organization that became known as SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And she was deeply involved with them as they forged a very different path than other civil rights organizations of the time, rather than protests and marches, which were still and already happening, SNCC took on the very dangerous task of grassroots organizing and voter registration drives in the rural South, not in the cities, not where you know you had sidewalks, where you had um, really scary places to be. And Bernice Johnson Reagan, who you didn't think I'd ever come back to, uh, joined the movement. She joined SNCC during the Albany, Georgia campaign in 1962. And as a founding member of the Freedom Singers, they raised thousands of dollars for the organization. And she describes Ella Baker as her political mother. Reagan states that she, she, Ella Baker, always greeted everyone. In the middle of the most intense movement crisis, Miss Baker would always ask you about your person, your home, your children, your food, your thinking. Through her asking, she taught us that no movement could exist without individuals and that any movement organization had to take care of its people, the ones who made up that movement. And one of the things that happened um, during these, these years was that a killing of those three young men during uh, Freedom, at the very beginning of Freedom Summer, actually before people even went south. And her words were captured by Bernice Johnson Reagan in a song that Sweet Honey in the Rock does, in which she proclaimed, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes, until the killing of black men, black mother sons is as important as the killing of white men, white a mother sons. So her words are profound. And she speaks about not clutching to power, not needing the light, but you must stand up against tyranny. And that brings us back to 1964 with Freedom Summer followed by the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which together helped, um, helped really create what was unfortunately seen as the end of the civil rights era. It wasn't, it still isn't, but it was an important step um, with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and um, voting rights, which culminated after the 1965 Selma marches, which were violent and ultimately ended up being um, one that pushed LBJ and Congress to finally pass that Voting Rights Act. But importantly, if we fast forward to 2013, renewing the provisions of the act had happened multiple times um, because it was originally, some of it was originally due to expire in five years. Um, after 1965, and then it got renewed multiple times. But in 2013, the Supreme Court, once again, the highest court in the land, deemed the specific provision that required Southern states to get approval from the US federal government before making changes um, to voting laws, they considered it, quote unquote, outdated. 
So essentially, they eviscerated the Voting Rights Act, and we saw a flood of voter suppression laws roll across the nation. So we find ourselves in 2021 taking on battles that theoretically were won decades ago. And the attack on voting rights is not some distinct historical memory in black and white photos with segregationist screaming expletives. Um, it's full color today with, yes, I will call out specific folks, Republicans attempting to disenfranchise African Americans, people of color, and poor people. With gerrymandering, uh, prison gerrymandering, all kinds of gerrymandering that goes on, voter ID laws, and attempts to do away with or significantly curtail mail-in and early voting, we are once again deep in the struggle. And folks like Stacey Abrams, as many of you know, she's the quintessential example of a fierce advocate for anti-voter suppression activism. But she's not alone. There are hundreds of, perhaps thousands, of nameless Black folks, Black women specifically, on the ground fighting to, again, maintain that ballot like their foremothers. There's so much more to this story that I wish I could tell you, but I have run out of time. So I'm going to close with that and say, one day, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. I pray that one day soon we shall overcome. One day soon. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Thank you for your time and attention. No, no, Roberta, thank you uh, for that wonderful, um, informative, and, and inspiring presentation. Just touching my heart, thank you. Uh, and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, and for your, for your attendance and for supporting Lapoca's work for peace and justice. And with that, we'll say good night. Thank you all.